Project Rafford, thank you for taking us here to the site of uh, the new distillery of Elixir Distillers, which is called Portnaturin. Portnaturin. Port yeah. yeah. So the IN is actually, you know, in Scotland we never do anything easy. Exactly. So the IN is actually pronounced the other way around, like a NA, Portnaturin. But here in Isla, we see things so fast, I can say put and Trune or put and Trune. It sounds the same. <laughs> <laughs> the, the site is close to Port, Port Elm, the, the town on the south coast and close to Lafroy. Why did you choose that site? I think it's such an iconic um, location. Um, other sites had been looked at originally um, around the island, but I think with the iconic um, pathway that there is mm. from Port Ellen all the way um, up towards Ardbeg, the location was really important to Sikinder to, to try and be here on the south coast amongst the other distilleries. Mm. And now we are uh, in a phase where the groundwork is done and construction will begin which is a little bit late, which I would say might be due to COVID and other circumstances. So when do you think that we'll, you will be finished from now? On? Yeah, I mean, there's a thing we refer to over here called Isla time. Yes. So very much um, we have been affected by Isla time and I think we will continue to be affected by some of the challenges of building such a, um, a big construction build really on the island. So if everything was to go according to plan from today, it should be that we would be commissioning by the end of next year. I see. And what will we find here then? What will the distillery look like? Uh, how many stills? What, which capacity and so on? Yeah. Um, so there's almost like uh, four elements to what we're building. So first of all, the main distillery itself is um, so more traditional in, in some of um, what we're putting in there where you will have your mill, your mash tun. We then have 14 washbacks and this is to support some of the different styles. I'll, mm. I'll talk a little on that. Um, and it will uh, provide us vacuity to do longer fermentations because obviously we need more capacity and holding time. From there you will go into a still house where you will have two wash stills and two spirit stills. The thing for Port Natruin is that we're taking both traditional and modern elements. So we look at what we believe truly affects quality and flavour and we make sure that we emphasise those but we can use modern technology to do some of this. So for instance, a modern mill, um, a semi-louter mash tun, but then when you get to the washbacks, it's a combination of wooden washbacks and stainless steel. The stainless steel having jackets on them where we can temperature control them. And mm -hmm. um, once you get into the still house, stills but direct fire on the wash stills because we believe from a quality point of view that's the type, uh, type of styles of liquid we want to make. It will be controlled by control systems and um, you know there will be a lot of that and part of that is um, just for um, ease of use but part of that is also because of what we want to do with our energy reuse and our water reuse to actually have control systems in place mm -hmm. really helps us and it helps us with our environmental impact so that's the main distillery at seven days production we're seeing about a million litres is, okay. is our target but again it depends on what we're producing because we're not just going to produce one type of spirit. There'll be at least four, maybe five different spirit characters that we will make throughout our year. And each one of those will have its own, um, what we would call a mashing plan. So it'll have its own recipe. Mm -hmm. um, so it will each have a different style or volume that goes into the mash tun. Each will have a different um, fermentation length a different yeast types and combinations of yeast types mm -hmm. for different flavour profiles and then into the still house different distillation regimes as well. So we will have clearly different products. They will all be port and trune, and it doesn't mean that all of them will automatically be individually um, produced later on. We will use them in blending so our blender then has okay. quite a palette um, to work with. So that's the main distillery. We have a traditional stroke modern maltings that is going to feed that distillery. So traditional in the sense that it's three storey um, floor maltings, right. um, modern in the sense that it has automated turners on it. So we will not be asking our staff to turn manually yeah. the malt every eight hours. We'll actually have turning machinery that will do that. So we still get the quality parameters from um, traditional floor maltings, mm -hmm. but actually we take some of the heavy lifting and, and manual labour out of that. So that will be fed from two steeps 
three floors in and one kiln. So the actual kiln building that you see in the pictures is an actual working kiln with pagodas on it, and that is the actual kiln itself. Um, so yeah, so that should allow us when we're on five day operation to do 100% all our own floor malted okay. um, product. And then if we ramp up to a seven day production in the future, it should give us about 80% of what we're looking for. Um, I would say that we are aiming that all of our spirit characters all have some phenol level in them, some lower, some higher. So we will work with um, what we get from the kiln and, and make sure that okay. it's going to the appropriate So there will spirit. be no um, amputed spirit? Uh, never say never. <laughs> it's not in the plan just now, but I would okay. never say anything. Uh, and I think when I talk about the next bit yeah. of the, the, the distillery, you'll understand why. But we're not going to close the door to doing anything. It's not going to be the traditional um, Port Natroon style, um, mm -hmm. I don't believe. However, when you have a toy like this that you can work with, why wouldn't you? And I think also it makes sense, especially early on when you're commissioning a distillery to use unpeated to try and actually understand your baseline efficiencies mm -hmm. and your baseline um, flavour profiles before you start then adding the phenol levels into that. So I'd imagine that at the beginning we will experiment a bit with unpeated, whether that will ever become a unique bottling or not, I don't know. But um, sometimes it's better to start that way just to see where all your flavours are before you add um, the phenol flavours in. So I think we will work with unpeated malt, mm -hmm. whether we will put out an unpeated spirit is um, still to be seen. The third element of what we're building is a second distillery. Um, so this is what we're referring to as the pilot plant. So it's an experimental distillery where we can make multiple spirit characters. So not just Scotch whiskey, although we will make Scotch whiskey in there, but we will be able to make anything. So within this distillery, much smaller footprint, um, we will have a hammer mill, which will allow us to process different cereal types. It will be a half ton mash only, so very small in that sense. So we'll have a mash conversion vessel. Mm -hmm. This also allows us to do other spirit types like rum, which is definitely, doesn't need to go through the mill, but um, will allow us to do rum products. Um, and then we have eight washback stainless steel, all with jackets on them to allow us to do temperature control within that. And then with the stills, we will have two pot stills, one which we can do direct fire on, two retorts and a column still. So there is over a dozen combinations of distillation that we can do within that um, small footprint. So that, as I say, will allow us to do, if we want to do grain whiskies, we can take malt from the main mm -hmm. Um, from the maltings and, and just produce small scales. So again, we can do experiments there that we might want to scale up into the larger distillery, create flavour profiles and play with it and, and take it into the larger distillery for bigger products. If we want to mash an entire mash in the main distillery and put all that liquid across into the washbacks in the experimental distillery, we can also do that. Um, and as I say, we can do rums. I'm not suggesting, I'll say the words gin, vodka, stone fruit. I'm not saying that we're going to make those, but we what could. I'm saying is, is we could. Um, and part of that is our desire to understand, our under, grow our understanding of distilling, work with other um, people in the industry mm. in um, growing um, our understanding of distilling and try and partner with um, research um, into whiskey as well. So make it really a true pilot plant. So beside that, we will be building... Um, nosing rooms and experimental lab, things like that, so we can actually do the whole thing um, and uh, classrooms as well. So, if we wanted to become a satellite of people coming to learn, um, or if you had people from, I don't know, Heriot Watt or the Scotch um, Whiskey Research Institute wanting to scale up their experiments, they could come and work oh. with us. So, the idea is, is to make it a place for community okay. um, within the industry um, and, you know, just trying to advance our, our knowledge. So that's predominantly, it's small scale, we're seeing probably about 100,000 litres max a year, but it depends on what we're making and how yeah, many sure. different um, products we would try and make in, in a period. So that's your main um, distillery, but then of course we have a visitor centre, um, you know, you'll have spent much time in visitor centres all around Scotland and here in Isla, and for the more traditional distilleries, you will see that they have been you know, they're utilising old buildings, so malt barns are classics or old warehouses and things like that. The joy of this project is, is we get to build that at the beginning and make it exactly what we need mm -hmm. uh, rather than retrofit an old building. So we will have three floors 
it will be the same height as is basically the Maltings building and sits alongside the Maltings building. So ground floor, reception, um, experience areas, shop. The first floor you will have more the nosing labs and tasting suites and tasting rooms and um, the site offices. And then on the top floor you can have a full bar and restaurant. Okay. So, so yes, yeah, so there will be um, for the visitors, but also for the locals alike, um, that will be putting that infrastructure in, and there will also be down on the shoreline a little tasting bothy because why would you not try and put something lovely in? So, our land goes all the way down to the sea, and we have plans to put a small tasting room um, down there as well. We'll also have a small warehouse um, beside the visitor centre mm. we're not going to warehouse all the product here on Isla and we're not going to start building hundreds of big warehouses but we will have a warehouse um, that we will be able to keep probably a lot of our experimental stuff mm. I'd have thought um, we will be able to do cask filling here at the distillery so that we can um, fill that warehouse and anything that we want to keep an eye on and we want to be okay. able to sort of um, sample throughout time but in there will also be areas to do tastings and events right. as well but Bottling will be off-site. Yeah. So um, for the main production, you know, if we get to the point where we're hitting mm -hmm. the million litres, you know, to keep that all here and then start putting up lots and lots yeah. of warehousing for, you know, to keep that 10, 20 years is, is not in our plan. And mm -hmm. um, we will centralise that to a location in Speyside, mm -hmm. which um, will obviously then... Um, also be a facility for our sister distillery in Speyside as well. So we will um, put everything into a facility, warehousing and bottling lines and everything up in Speyside. Yeah. Uh, a question about the style you want to produce here. You said you have a special style of whiskey in mind. How will it differ from, from the other styles here on, on Isla? Will it? Yeah, I think um, what we're looking at really is that traditional. Um, Sikindra, if anyone knows them, knows he rare and old whiskies and um, traditional styles and I think that's where if you start looking at some of the elements of what we're putting into the distillery and um, so floor malted malt and um, you know unique flavors from that how we manage the mash tun more for um, quality rather than just efficiency mm -hmm. fermentation so we touched on it earlier on 14 washbacks for a million litre distillery, you don't need that if you're only doing 48 or 60 hour fermentations. Some of the, um, for one of the styles that we have um, drawn up the, the flavour profile for, we're talking minimum 120 hour fermentations. And then yeasts, instead of just taking in that one um, yeast type that gets tankered into the island that the distilleries are using, again, for efficiency purposes, mm -hmm. as much as flavour profile, we are working with our um, yeast partners to actually find specific yeasts for each of these types of spirit that will mm. give us different flavours. So whether we want tropical fruits or whether we want to go for a shorter fermentation style and go for a more cereal nutty, we are working on the different yeast types that will give us those profiles. And then once you take it to the still house, direct fire stills, there is no doubt there is a uniqueness of flavour that comes um, from that sort of caramelisation that happens during that process mm. um, into the spirit. And then on the stills themselves, we have cooling jackets um, on the lye pipes. So again, we can increase or decrease reflux mm. to create lighter or heavier styles. So there is all these touch points throughout um, our process that allows us to create unique okay. spirits for ourselves. So all in all, you could say it's a pretty traditional way to make whiskey, longer fermentation. In a modern, yeah, but yeah. in a modern yeah. setting, absolutely. So that's the idea is, is use the modern technology, but what is it that truly gives flavour um, and don't change those things or emphasise those things? And that's that's what we're trying to do. I think, you know, we want to make uh, Isla-style whisky. I mean, that, you know, Sikindra could have built a distillery anywhere in Scotland, but, you know, his love for Isla is why he's um, been determined to build the distillery and his love of showcasing what is the best that could be made um, of Isla-style whiskies. That's what he's after. Um, now, we... You know, within the first, you know, three months I um, was working with Elixir, my first job was to say, tell me what you want it to taste like, and then work that back, create the, the production plan for that, so that we can then check that the, the equipment that we're putting into the distillery is going to meet all the needs that we need. So the number of washbacks, the size of the mash tun, that, that sort of thing, and um, shape and size of stills. 
So that was a piece of work that was done very early on um, to make sure that we actually are, are fitting the, the, the needs of the spirit. So that was really, really important. Um, and then, of course, um, the other huge part of it is the building design and, and making sure that sort of everything's laid out nicely, aesthetically nice. Um, again, we can make the two routes perfect you know we can make it all fit together the, the visitor mm. journey is there because we get to design it at the beginning which is a unique situation to be in rather than a distillery that is growing um, you know over 200 years or 150 years before you took a visitor around it and it's and um, then being sort of changed and fitted to to make it fit for visitors so we're, we're in a very unique position in that way so a lot to look forward to when the distillery opens probably next year, probably the year <laughs> after that. Uh, let us jump a little bit over to the mainland and to the second distillery of Elixir Distillers, Tormor. Yeah. What's going on there and what's planned there? So it's very early days. <laughs> um, uh, so we were lucky that last, in fact, it'll be a year tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So on the 20th of June last year, we announced um, that we'd be purchasing um, Tormor Distillery from Chivas. Um, it then took us six months to do the project for takeover. Um, it's Tormor has the capability, if it works seven days, to make 4.8 million litres. Yeah. So it is a, a large distillery. Um, we operate five days as Chivas did previous to us. And um, so from that point in June up to taking the keys on the 19th of December, it was to really set ourselves up because we were going to start producing in January, which we did. So really we had six months to put everything in place to take over that distillery. Now this is a lot of the stuff I was working on for, for here on Isla, but I had to do it very quickly. Luckily I'd done a lot of um, pre-work anyway for this distillery. But yeah, we had to get ourselves in a position where we found a compliance manager, a project manager to work with me. We found a distillery manager, assistant manager. We did get um, subcontracted to us for six months, the Chivas operators, so from January through to actually they finish up with us in the next couple of weeks. Um, they were subcontracted to us until we got our own team in, but we mm. now have 10 um, operation staff that we've employed as well during that time. And on the 6th of January, we started back up um, as the new owners of, of that distillery. So really from, it was just the Christmas shutdown that it naturally would be shut. And Chivas were the owners until a point. And then come January, we were the owners and we started straight away at the same production level. So we do 18 mashes a week, 10.4 tonne mashes. So um, we, we've been producing at that level ever since. And it's, okay. it's been going great. I've always had the impression that Tormo has a very special style, very unique style you don't find in other Speyside distilleries. Are you trying to keep this? Are you trying to change this? So we're doing a bit of both. So we're just now we haven't changed anything. Mm. We're, we're making the Tormo style and we're learning about it as we um, mm. do it as well. And it has a really beautiful fruity Speyside style. Um, we are looking at what we want to enhance, what we might want to bring more to the front flavour wise. Mm. And again, we're talking to yeast suppliers and people like that. And we are looking at what we might change around fermentations and, and things like that. But at this moment in time, we're, we're producing as was with a move to maybe doing a bit of experimenting later on this year um, to see what we can um, do with enhancing the new make. So that's happening at this moment in time. The sort of project plans in place for that. The other big project we're working on for Tor Moore is that um, being part of a larger company like Chivas, a lot of the production or non-production needs were centralised. So, for instance, all the spirit is currently tankered away mm -hmm. from Tor Moore. Whereas we are going to be reinstating the filling store, so that project's in place just now. Um, we've just got all the water systems put in to do reduction and at the end of this month the company that we're working with on the actual cask filling system comes in and mm -hmm. starts putting that in. We have to have that in to start filling our own casks on site by the first week in October so everything's sort of gearing towards that at this moment in time and that's why although it was five operators um, who operated Tormo before we now have 10 because a lot of that is warehousing um, and we have to do all our own right. warehouse movements ourselves which um, we have quite a number to do and 
then we, we have the, the cask filling to do as well. So so everything's sort of gearing towards doing um, all of that ourselves on the site. Mm-hmm. So I see it more as that traditional small independent distillery um, in Speyside where, you know, the guys have been taught how to use ride on lawnmowers next week so they can cut the grass I mean you know, everything we can do in house to give ownership um, to the operators at that site that's that's the, how we'll do it it's obviously an iconic distillery Absolutely. there is no doubt that Secunder um, has been incredibly lucky um, to be able to purchase Tor more and, and furthermore apart from the fact that it's always been the sort of first distillery that people always traditionally saw obviously we have the Cairn now but um, traditionally the first distillery as you went into Speyside and it signified being in Speyside almost in a way didn't it um, and beautiful with the, the design of the building and the topiary and everything so it was already in the whiskey connoisseur and drinkers subconscious but if you ask someone what Tormor tasted like they wouldn't be able to tell you because they never ever produced um, a consistent and I don't mean consistent in style or quality I just mean consistent as in availability um, product you know so there was maybe a bottling for France a 14 a 16 there'd be Gordon McPhail have got bottlings of some nice old 70s which we've tried Um, you know so but if you said you know tell us what Tormore is people know it's high quality but beyond that they don't know and so it allows us um, to have that blank canvas almost mm-hmm. like it is a new distillery but at the same time we probably already having been in the subconscious people are going to be excited to, to find out more about it you know so um, I think it's the best of both worlds for us um, obviously as part of the purchase we did purchase a volume of uh, mature spirit as well and one of the big things just now is our master blender going through the stocks and we're a part of the deal as well yeah absolutely absolutely because we have to be able to put out a brand um Mm. before 10 and 12 years time so we have mature stocks as well and ollie um, oliver chilton our master blender he's up um, for a week every month just now and has been since january going through sample after sample after sample to try and make sure that he knows exactly where we are with um, the mature spirit, what directions we might want to take that mature spirit in through um, selection of wood types um, and then starting to really do a bit of groundwork just now to have a core product. Now, again, timelines next year at some point there'll be a core product. Again, we will not rush. Um, we always joke, you know, the, the whiskey will tell us when it's ready, um, you know, and that's what we'll be led by rather than this need to put something out mm. to you know, um, to get something on the market quick. So really that's the work. And so Ollie's looking at some stuff that we filled um, at back end of last year and, you know, watching the journey of that new spirit now that it's six months later and, you know, what's what's happening um, so that he can then make the plans for the future as well as right now what spirit we've got as well. So really, really interesting. And for someone like myself as well, who having worked for larger distilling companies, you were very much... You worked in production, you know, you worked um, in in sort of your department being now exposed and working really across um, from the grain in right to the the mature stocks is really, really interesting. We have an amazing distillery manager, um, Polly Logan. And Polly and I worked together for quite a number of years in Diageo, and that's how we know each other. And she's worked in numerous Diageo um, distilleries in Speyside, um, Ben Rennes, Dalu, and um, before that she was with Tomatin. And then laterally she has been a master blender at McAllen, um, but was uh, had a desire to get back into distillery production management, really, and so it was a perfect fit for us um, for her to take on. So her and Ollie really are working really closely together, looking at those stocks and, and working where we're going to be. Hand in hand with that, of course, once we really get a, a real feel for where we are with the um, mature spirit, then that will almost guide us into the brand Mm -hmm. rather than the other way around, try and force a brand on a liquid. Again, look at the liquid and see where that takes us with our brand as well. And then we can bring everything together with the bottles and packaging and everything else that has to happen. So um, there's a rush um, um, to some of it, um, especially around glass selection, packaging and things like that. But um, when it comes to the liquid just now, we're just um, we're just in that period where you have to kind of wait and see how, how it's progressing. Um, and we're doing a bit of recasking and, and, and things like that just now as well, which is really interesting. 
Chori, it was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for your time and thank you for the interview. You're very welcome.